Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to this session on fiscal policy space. Uh, I'm Barry Rabe. I'm the director of the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy, CLOSA. We are delighted to be joined in our sponsorship today by the Citizens Research Council, the Nonprofit and Public Management Center, and the Center for Social Impact. I also want to take this occasion to introduce and officially welcome the two members of our entering post uh, postdoctoral class at CLOSA. Uh, we're really excited to have a terrific team of junior scholars. Uh, and I want to just briefly introduce and welcome Dr. David Uhl from the University of Toronto, who will be joining us in the coming months. Soon to be Dr. David Uhl, it's very close. And Dr. Sarah Mills, Sarah, Sarah, uh, who's joined us earlier from Architecture and Planning. Welcome to you both. You'll be hearing more from them in coming close-up events. Um, the topic for today is one of these really great public policy questions, so appropriate to this time and so appropriate to this region, the future of our cities and their fiscal viability going forward. In thinking about people to talk thoughtfully about this, it's hard to imagine a better candidate than you have today. And this is an individual who's contributed in so many ways over the course of his career to our understanding of these issues in a wide range of leadership roles, among them the co-editorship of one of the premier urban affairs journals in the world for more than a decade, currently the dean of the College of Urban Planning and Public Affairs at the University of Illinois Chicago, where he recently had to move an entire faculty across, building, across campus because of building and other issues, and was also dean of another college in the middle of this, which I've never heard of before, doing two deanships at the same time the author of five books and numerous publications, and I've actually never said this publicly, but two of the last three major projects I began, research projects, began with reading a lot of your work, and so I'm deeply in your debt. He also directs the UIC Urban Forum on Key Urban Issues, and has played a major, major role over a couple of decades now with the National League of Cities. Somehow he found time in the middle of all of this to launch and direct the Fiscal Policy Space Project, based at UIC with a number of partners supported by the MacArthur Foundation, which is examining city fiscal behavior and city financial adaptations during the Great Recession. It is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce Michael Pagano. Thank you very much, Barry. Very kind words. I paid him enough, I think. Uh, good, after good afternoon. It is even in Chicago. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I was told before I came here that I should find something to connect with an audience from the University of Michigan. And I said, well, that's blue, right? Don't you do this go blue thing? And my wife reminded me that I'm a Penn State alumnus, and so that's a different kind of blue. But there is another connection. Uh, how many of you are, are, uh, go to football games at all? Yeah. So I grew up in Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and was very proud when the band and the football team decided that they could actually perform in the big house. And I don't know that they filled it, but it certainly, with capacity at their stadium is all of 5,000. They certainly surpassed that. So uh, it's, it's good to be here. I appreciate the invitation, the kind words, and an opportunity to engage in a conversation um, that is near and dear to my heart, which is the fiscal position and well-being and behavior of, of municipalities. Uh, this is a, uh, as Barry said, this is a, a very uh, uh, broad and large project. We are not at the end. Uh, we are still at the data analysis uh, part of the, of the project. And we'll be issuing a major report uh, sometime before the end of the calendar year, God willing. And uh, we are, we're at a point that I would like to generate as much interest uh, with all of you and, and, and hear your uh, reaction and feedback. So this is the, this is the, the outline of the presentation today. Um, the, I think the, a major, I hope a major contribution of this project is to reframe the public discourse and the political discourse about cities' finances, cities in particular. We could probably extend it to other local governments and even the state. 
uh, the states, but uh, in particular this project focuses on, on cities and reframing the conversation. And then we'll move into a, 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 some of the background work and then the project itself. So first thing is that I, I, we weren't satisfied with the way the conversation about cities, having, having the right frame is important, having the right words are important describing the narrative is important and we use shorthand words uh, to do, so close up, what a great name, I don't know if this was your invention, but close up just sort of sums up everything, I thought well that's just terrific. It, it's finding the word to capture what it is that you're trying, in this case a center or a concept that you're trying to put forward and once you've captured that, you've captured the conversation. So I was listening this morning to, uh, um, uh, to morning edition in which the there are counties in the Commonwealth of Kentucky that are invoking the right to declare themselves right to work counties and I always found that to be an interesting right to work. So how could you not be in favor of right to work until you realize what it means? But the concept, that word has right to work, that's terrific. So it's really looking at the world through a different lens grabbing the narrative in a way that we can rethink what we're talking about and maybe provide better clarity and for my purposes it's not just clarity in the concept but the applicability of the concept to solve public problems in, in this case is the problem of, uh, of public finance or municipal finance. Second is um, we are all unique. We are all individuals are unique and all municipalities and all states are unique. We do not live in a unitary system and we, we worship the fact that places are different. And yet our narrative and our conversation tends to blur that. We, we, move, from, um, we move to a position of sameness and uniqueness. We, we want this sense of moving toward the mean and in fact much of our conversation has to do with comparing my city or myself to the mean, to the average. Medicine got it right. It's been a number of years now that they've stopped talking about clusters of people and treating clusters of people or all humans alike, but rather diagnosing problems with individuals and prescribing an individual approach to addressing their concerns. It's that kind of approach that we need to take and that's what the fiscal policy space is, attempts to do. So a word, and I may be stepping on toes here, but a word, or words, that I, I try not to use because I don't find them to be very useful are best practices. Best practices means that if only you would mimic my behavior, we all would be vanilla ice cream. I like vanilla ice cream, but we would all taste like vanilla ice cream or we would all be doing exactly the same kinds of things, whether they're good or bad or obnoxious. Doesn't matter. Mimicking behavior. Again, this project on fiscal policy space is about understanding the diversity, the differences, the uniqueness of municipalities and how to address the problems that they have. So the objectives of this presentation and of the project is to reframe the dialogue from city fiscal conditions, which tends to be the fairly common parlance of cities and their finances, to city fiscal behavior. That is how cities respond to certain stimuli within a controlled environment. Second is to identify pathways of adjustment by filling data gaps, which is part of what I'll be talking about. The, the data collection process on this has been um, monumental. And finally, to not to completely diss the idea that we can learn from others. I just don't believe there are best practices that apply to all people or all cities at all times. But rather, there are cities that are similar because they have similar decision space or fiscal policy space within which they operate and they can learn from each other, although we wouldn't uh, at this point advocate mimicking behavior. So let me, well, let me walk through a couple of things that sort of prompted this project from years ago. As, as Barry noted, uh, I have um, been involved with the National League of Cities in their annual city fiscal conditions uh, report since its inception. Uh, in 1986 when I was only eight or nine years old and in 1991 I became the author or co-author of each of the annual reports. The, the, the City Fiscal Conditions Report is the only contemporary snapshot of municipal finances that's, that's at least um, 
uh, accessible today rather than five years from now. Uh, and so we're a little quicker than census is. It's also if a, a, a report or a collection of data on just one element of government or municipal finances, and that's the general fund. It doesn't include all the enterprise funds. We do have de de uh, data on the, on the capital funds, but we haven't, uh, the, the data are too, they're, they're not very good in that. But the general fund is where we've, we've been focusing mo most of our attention. So I wanna talk a bit about what we've learned from these, uh, these reports on the general fund conditions of municipalities and that there are, there's a lot of work on, on fiscal conditions. So the city fiscal conditions report in 2014 is the latest one. It was released last, uh, last September, October. And what we found, not too surprising if you follow city finances, um, there was a small decline in, re so let me back up just a second, you're all understanding of what um, uh, municipal finances are about. But because all municipalities, almost all municipalities, depend to some extent on property tax receipts. When the property, when the real estate bubble burst in 2007 and the stock market collapsed in 2008, the impact on municipalities wasn't felt for a couple of years because of assessment practices. You don't get your property tax bill. I don't know what it's like in Michigan, but I'm paying my property tax bill today from 2011. So there, there's, I'm sorry, 2012. There's a, there's a few year lag between the, the bill and the value of your properties. And it's always good when property values are escalated because you say, gee, my house is worth 50,000. I know I could sell it for 70. I must be getting a discount. That's great. But when it goes the other way, you're saying, wait, my house isn't worth 70,000. It's only worth 50,000 now, and I'm still paying at the higher rate. That's the lagging in property uh, tax assessments, which means that the fiscal cycle lags the business or economic cycle by several, by several years. We are still coping with the decline of the, uh, the impact of the Great Recession today. Uh, so these are some of the, I'll, I'll show some of these in just a second. So one of the questions, I was talking to Tom earlier that this is what you do at close up, of uh, trying to understand for, for Michigan uh, local governments what their perception is of, of this, either the city manager or the mayor. Here we ask the perception of the CFO of the municipalities. The sample is all cities over 50,000 and we get a re response rate of, uh, it's an annual report, the re response rate has ranged between 32 and 46 percent over the years. So. Uh, th this sort of not what you would not let's put this in positive terms. This is what you would expect, right? When the economy is booming in the 1990s, CFOs are pretty confident that next year is even going to be better. In 2000, um, in 2007, 70 percent of the CFOs thought that this year was better than last year. Then we asked them, well, what about next year? In 2007. Over half of the municipal, these are CFOs. The, we weren't asking uh, the, the, the clerical workers. We weren't asking the interns. We were asking the chief finance officer of the city. What do you think next year is going to be? Over half of them thought 2008 was going to be better than 2007. 2007 is when the real estate bubble burst. They were not anticipating it. And so we collect data on year-to-year uh, -year general fund revenue and expenditure data. Back, as I said, back to 1986, and you can see that um, again, uh, during the economic decline, that's that yellowed area, there are the, the formal recessions that uh, the national, um, the NBER identifies uh, every year. And believe it or not, the recession, the Great Recession, only lasted from December 2007 to June 2009. I think those who were still looking for work in 2010 through 13 and 14 wondered how it ended so soon because. Uh, jobs were still scarce at the time, but that's the official definition of, of a recession. And you can see that at that time, what's important to note is that revenues continued to decline after the, the, the peak, the trough of the, the recession. In part, it's because, that, uh, because of the, the uh, property tax collections lag. But this is the average. This is the average growth for municipalities or the average change in revenues and expenditures for municipalities. And you look across that, and it was always fun to go to meetings with, with um, uh, mayors and managers and CFOs and say, see, revenues have increased by 2%. And said, Not in my town it hasn't. And in fact, we said, well, why is that? So we started asking questions a little better, and that is not just what is the general fund revenue, but what's the composition of the general fund? In other words, most municipalities, and, and now all large municipalities, I always put an asterisk by this before, uh, levy a property tax. Um, one of the largest cities in the country 
Mesa, Arizona didn't levy a, a, a property tax until 2009 because it had to be approved by the voters and the voters just wouldn't approve it until 2009. So now all municipalities have some sort of a, of a property tax. But they don't all depend on the property tax. Cities that have only the property tax as a general tax form do, but there are a lot of municipalities with a more diverse revenue mix. And to understand that, you understand how they respond to economic cycles or to business cycles. So if you look at the, unfortunately the yellow covered up a bit of the blue, I guess that's a greenish, whatever. Um, if you look at the line that's supposed to be the sales tax collection, the blue line, you see that when a recession hits, immediately retail sales begin to decline. So does income tax collections. Very few, only about 9% of municipalities collect an income tax. Uh, the most prevalent is your neighbor to the south in Ohio. The other is Pennsylvania. And then there are municipalities. I, th I think the last number for Michigan was 23 municipalities collect an income tax in Michigan. Uh, most in Kentucky, which are very few municipalities, and a few in Alabama. St. Louis and Kansas City and Missouri, New York City, and of course my favorite is Yonkers, New York, which I don't quite understand. But at any rate, outside of those, munici those municipalities, uh, others are prohibited from collecting the income tax. Sales and income taxes tend to decline immediately when a recession hits. We stop buying, we don't have a paycheck, we don't have uh, income withholding. Property, on the other hand, goes through the recession because the collection point for the decline in property values isn't until a couple of years out. In the, um, during the dot-com bust of 2000-2001, which is the first recession identified up here, you'll notice that the green bar, which is property tax collections, remain positive. This is year-to-year -year growth, remain positive through that period of time and doesn't decline until uh, 2010 that is three years after the start of the, uh, the, the burst of the, of the real estate bubble is when we notice for the first time a decline in year-to-year -year collection of, of property taxes. Now, sales and income again increase by 2012, 13, and 14, but that's only over the prior year. If you aggregate all of those together, property sales and income taxes, today, 2014 that is, we are, st we are at about 92% of collections in 2007. So even though we've had three years of total growth uh, in the sales and income tax, property tax increases have lagged and have held down uh, the growth so that we're only, uh, we're not back to the pre-recession um, levels. General fund uh, ending balances, these are, these are similar to the savings accounts. Uh, states have what they call um, uh, rainy day funds, which they'll sock money away in, uh, for a rainy day and they'll bring it back out when there's a recession. Municipalities don't. They tend to have what they call reserves. And they'll, they'll put money in a reserve and pull it out whenever they need it. They'll often roll it into the, uh, the, um, uh, the incoming or the, the, the new year budget as, as a transfer from the last year or a rollover from the, from the previous year. And they think of these as savings accounts. A lot of cities will set aside money in this account or not spend it as a way of, as you would if you're trying to buy a car. You wait for three or four years and you pay cash for the car at the end. They use it for capital assets. They also use it for, um, I think you've had two, just like we have had two years in a row of uh, unpredictable weather in which um, last year, I don't know what it is in uh, this year, but a year ago, the city of Chicago uh, ran through its salt and snow removal budget in January and the worst of the winter hadn't hit yet. The reason? Because it's based on a forecast. Where do they get, and the forecast, the previous 12 years had been fairly mild. The last two years we've been hammered. Where do they get the extra, you're in the middle of the, of the fiscal year, where do you get the funding to provide for snow removal and salting? Well, you reach into your reserves and you draw it down. What happens when you hit a recession? Same thing. You still have union obligations, that is, uh, union contracts tend to be multi-year, and if you're in the first or second year of a five-year contract, you've got to continue to, to, to pay them. So we'll draw down on ending balances or the reserves in order, in order to ensure some consistent level of service delivery during a recessionary period. So you draw that down in each of these recessionary uh, uh, eras, the, um, the actual uh, ending balances remain flat or declined, and they increase in, in, uh, in other years. 
uh, the, the academic research, and I won't go through all of these except to make two points. The academic research uh, identifies many, many ways of measuring fiscal stress or economic stress or changes in city wealth or other measures that we, we hope can reflect the well-being of the municipality. Most of those, and, and uh, to just show, tip my hat a bit, I think one of the, the, the best studies, most comprehensive was done, it's now an old study by Ladd and Yinger called America's Ailing Cities, in which they identify what they call standardized fiscal health. And what they were trying to say is, if all municipalities had access to the same tax levers, what capacity do they have? And also recognizing that taxes, some taxes are more exportable than others, meaning that, um, uh, if you own property, commercial property in, the, in downtown Chicago, you may be an owner who lives in Miami Beach. And so you're effectively transferring some funds in the pro due to the property tax. There's not a lot of tra transfer that way. The largest exportable tax is the income tax, according to their calculations. And yet, uh, so interest, interesting study, measure of fiscal health, but it makes assumptions, as do, do many of these indices, the, um, the, 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 um, the um, uh, representative tax system that ACIR created and was picked up by Bob Tannenwald later, and uh, the uh, Hirschman and Herfindahl index, all make a, basically the same what I consider to be inappropriate comparison. And what it is, is they compare your city to the average city. So if you look at the Herfindahl Hirschman index, they're effectively saying if you have four if you have four revenue sources and they are 25% of the total, how close are you to the 25% of, of, of each of those? And the answer is, as I just said, 90% of municipalities are forbidden legally or constitutionally from accessing the income tax, so it really doesn't help policymakers. It's a nice intellectual construct. It's not a good construct to advise policymakers as to what to do. Again, the comparison to the average when you don't want to be compared. This, everybody's in Lake Wobegon, right? We're all above average. But even <laughs> besides the Lake Wobegon effect, um, to compare us to the average assumes that all cities have access to the same tax levers and the same spending responsibilities as well. So during the Great Dis uh, Recession, tremendous dislocation, huge exogenous shock that had a differential effect across, uh, across municipalities. And it exposed a lot of gaps that we have, a lot of gaps in data, knowledge and research, and the policy solutions, which is what we're trying to introduce with the fiscal policy space. And each city has a unique set of challenges. Again, emphasizing uniqueness, that averages don't matter a whole lot, and we need to reset the frame. And so we created something called the fiscal policy space. This came about from a number of focus groups and conversations with a lot of, of uh, academics, policy analysts, and mayors and city managers and CFOs of municipalities over a number of years. And we said, so what is it that you do? And how do you know what to do and what constrains you? And for most of the responses, what we hear is that, you know, we don't think about what constrains us because that's what we operate. That is our environment. That's our assumed environment. We don't, and I said, well, let's talk about what those are. So we've identified what we consider to be the five key attributes of the constraint, or the expansion, but the constraint on fiscal policy behavior on the part of, of uh, municipal officials. The first is the intergovernmental context. Of course, I'm a federalism scholar. This is clear that the United States, with a federal system in which municipalities only exist because the states allow them to exist and not because the federal government created them, not mentioned in the U.S. Constitution, mentioned in all state constitutions, and are regulated by their states. So what are those items in which the state uh, over which the state regulates the behavior of municipalities? One is there are, there are limitations on what they can do on taxing and spending. Property taxes in many states are capped or, or expenditures are, are restricted to uh, the growth in population or, or um, the cost of living. And access to taxes. Almost all municipalities can access the property tax. Only a little more than half of municipalities, about 55%, can access a sales tax and only around 9 or 10 percent can access an income tax. Those are the three main general, uh, nationwide general tax sources. There are others. There are, there are uh, utility taxes, telecom taxes, but they, 
they vary. They're, they're not general taxes that uh, municipalities have access to around the country. Second is that there, there obviously is a wealth element that taxes are connected to. That's the underlying, the underlying economic base, what the city derives its resources from. So if the city's, I, I know we're close to Detroit, as the city's economic base declines, the, cap, the capacity, no matter what fiscal linkages the, the city has, the capacity to generate additional resources from a shrinking pie is very different, more challenging than accessing additional resources from an expanding pie. So we need to understand the connection between the fiscal architecture of the municipality and its underlying economic base. We'll talk about measures for that in just, in just a few minutes. And third is that as much as states constrain the behavior of municipalities, cities self-constrain. So many cities actually pass something like a property tax limitation that they have to abide by. Not imposed by the state, but imposed locally by themselves. And these last two, I'm, I, they, you notice they flip, flashed up together. I said there were five. The, the, the fourth is we have to be cognizant of the demands and preferences that we, municipal officials have to be cognizant of the demands and preferences of the citizens, the residents, the users of services within the municipality. In other words, it's, it's a demand function that we just can't operate as if the person or corporation that's demanding services uh, don't exist. The demands and preferences for quantity and quality of services vary across the country. There are some municipalities that couldn't imagine not having four day a week garbage pickup. There are other municipalities in which the residents couldn't imagine for paying for more than one day a week pickup of garbage. We have demands and preferences change. Local political culture, this is the one that our, in, in political science we have a lot of fun with because we know that it's different in Ann Arbor than it is in Birmingham, but what's different about it? Well, it's political culture. It's, it sort of becomes the unexplained term. It's attempted to be explained in many, many occasions. Um, I did know Dan Elazar quite well, and I appreciate what he created with the three subcultures, and it helps us understand that there are differences in expectations, outlook, approaches to freedoms and liberties, et cetera, et cetera, and there is no way that we can identify exactly what that is. So we've collapsed that variable or attribute into the demands and preferences, saying that it probably shows up, political culture, what we want probably shows up in what we demand of our local governments. So big asterisk there, sorry. Th this was a, a uh, by the way, a first uh, articulated in a, a piece that uh, Chris Haney and I uh, wrote for the Lincoln Institute um, back in 2010. And we realized that there was a lot of connection between the fiscal policy space framework that we were trying to create and, um, and Liz Ostrom's uh, uh, institutional analysis and development framework as well. And the, 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 the connections were pretty striking and pretty different. Where as she talks about an action situation, we're talking about, about one type of action situation in the fiscal policy arena, and she identifies biophysical conditions. We're talking about the underlying economic base, that is that, that organism that we derive or uh, uh, take resources from in order to survive. Uh, the rules in use, the intergovernmental context, the rules are imposed by the state as to what we can do and what we can't do, what we have access to and what we don't. And the attributes of the community, and here, political culture and demands of preferences of citizens, as well as the local legal context. So to anticipate a bit, the local legal context is, is a, it tends to be a minor part in this conversation. So we created a framework, uh, everybody has to have a visual, right? So we threw in this visual as a way of thinking about this as, um, um, as, as a, a base of, of two big circles. The economic base cities can only do what it has the resource base to drive from. The intergovernmental context, which, which also varies quite a bit across the way. Then there are the, the, the actions, the revenue decisions and the spend, spending decisions inside that are framed by or are influenced by the demands and preferences of the citizens and the revenue constraints um, and transfers or the fiscal architecture of the municipality. So this project was large enough we decided we couldn't review the fiscal policy behavior of 19,700 municipalities, so we identified a representation from the municipal spec, uh, sector um, and using, uh, making sure we had a diverse sample and, of course, feasibility of data collection. So we selected the largest central cities in the 100 largest metropolitan statistical areas. 
So we began with the statistical, the, the MSAs, and selected just the, the largest city from that. So we, you end up missing a lot when you're in larger MSAs. We understand that, but we also acknowledge that. And it looks like this by census region. Again, just a pretty map. It looks, um, for our purposes, more useful to look at it this way. And that is, what was, is the tax, the general tax authority of the municipalities of those, of those hundred cities? So the cities in green have access to three of the three main uh, uh, general revenue sources, sales, property, and income. I included Seattle and Spokane, uh, Washington in that, not because they have an income tax, but they have a gross receipts tax that in many ways uh, mirrors an, an income tax. And just to demonstrate that at least it's tied to the, the wealth of, in this case, the wealth of firms, uh, it, is a, it is a very prevalent tax in, in Washington state. But the others are typical uh, income or wage taxes, the other, those other uh, five cities. The, the yellow uh, cities are those that have access to the property and usually the sales tax, um, uh, not, uh, except for, this, except for um, Ohio and Pennsylvania and Michigan, as it turns out, where it's the property and the income tax that th those municipalities have uh, access to. The, um, the red states are, are the states that have access to only the property tax. They do not have access to the, uh, are, they don't have the authority to levy a sales or an income tax. Uh, the, the exception to that statement are those two cities in Oklahoma in which they have <laughs> access only to a sales tax, which is kind of interesting. And, We'll talk about why that's interesting at the very end. Data collection efforts, uh, th this, this consumed the better part of two years. Um, we, data on state collected, state imposed tells since 1980 for all 50 states were collected and coded by the constraining effect, which I'll show in just a second, but also by something I think that's even more important to measure, and that is the actual property tax gap rather than the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the statute or the, uh, the legislation. Each city is coded, is coded also according to its authorities, I just did it, to the three general tax sources. The economic base attribute relying on census, which we, you can understand, but we also connected the economic base to the fiscal architecture of the municipality. So let me just take a second to explain why that's important. Economic base, in, in most economic, um, uh, mo most studies that rely on a measure of economic base, economists default to per capita income or some measure of income within the municipality. That demonstrates roughly what the wealth of the, of the municipality is. And that's, that, may be, that may be useful for understanding the economic base, but if you don't have access as a city to the tax on that income, then what are you taxing? Only if all of the income wealth is, falls into property exactly in the proportion that it, it, uh, it is in the, uh, the wealth or the income side does property reflect the value of the municipality. But municipalities have access, some of them have access to three, most of them to two sources of revenue. So it's really the growth in that connection between the fiscal architecture and that economic base. So if your property base is not increasing, but your sales tax or your, your retail sales in the community is, it doesn't help the fiscal fortune of the municipality. You may be able to buy a whole lot, but it's not coming back to the city. In those cases, usually counties benefit from that, but not, but not the municipality. So we, we've created a measure that linked the fiscal architecture to the three measures of the economic base that, that link to property, per capita income, and, uh, and retail sales. The local legal context, boy, this is a tough one. Uh, we went through uh, the ordinances of the 100 municipalities back to 1980 to see at what time did they impose a locally imposed uh, pro primarily property tax um, uh, attribute. This was a project that was, be was begun by an economist about eight years ago and she gave us our data, her data, thank God, and we went back and tried to pick up uh, from where she left off. It was, um, there's, a, there's an interesting slide on that. This is probably the most difficult part. How do you collect data on fiscal policy actions that municipalities took or thought about? Well, um, this would be an entire year's project just on one city to look at all the fiscal policy actions that a city were to think about. So what we did was we relied on a search from uh, on newspapers and LexisNexis, and what we were trying to pick out from that were major changes in fiscal policy that rose to the level of being covered by, uh, by the news media. 
it may not be the best. It isn't the best, but it's all we had. And finally, city financial data. We can only go back to, two, uh, to um, uh, we wanted to go back to 1982 to pick up the uh, every five years the census of government to match the census of governments with what we're, we could collect from the electronic municipal market access. Uh, data were not available from 1987 and 1982 on a consistent basis, so we began in 1992 every five years to 2012. And then Merit Research provided data for us um, on only two years, 2007 and 12, for infrastructure and pension liabilities, primarily because anything before 2002 was not consistent across municipalities. So what we have in this database are consistent measures of all of these for the, for the 100 municipalities. So we began to cluster data by um, uh, through legal research through, uh, on LexisNexis to find out uh, um, what exactly the, uh, uh, the statute said about the restriction on, um, on tax and expenditure limitations. And then we ca calculated the actual gap. And I think I've already said this. We did create a, a, a demand variable, which will be controversial, I'm sure, but uh, we, um, we asked another of our, our team members to go through the literature on uh, how to measure demand and preferences of, of citizens and what would be a single index that we might use to best represent whether, there, whether the demand pressure actually shrinks the fiscal policy space. And again, the, the, the idea behind this is the more fiscal policy space, the more opportunity municipal officials have to uh, maneuver within that fis fiscal policy space to address their concerns. The more that's constrained, the more that it's taken up, the, less oppor the, the fewer opportunities they have. So the demand for services was measured by the percent union of the workforce in the city. The Democratic vote, assuming that there with Democratic mayors there are, or, or councils, there are stronger demands on services, which means more expenditures per capita, and percent poverty, which is a demand measure um, as well. So the tell measurements we used, uh, straight out of the, the, the literature on trying to understand the restrictiveness of tells, that either on the rate limit or the assessment growth, it's probably not terribly binding. So not all tells are the same. Uh, and we then created this uh, state, it's a map of the states. Those with no tells are the darker ones. Those, I'm sorry, this really got washed out, didn't it? Uh, those, the, the, the very lightest of those have a, have a binding, well, maybe it shows up quite well. If you notice the Southwest disappeared, that's where the most binding tax and expenditure limitations are. Uh, the uh, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, Colorado, California, and uh, uh, Nevada. Um, and Nebraska, and that is Colorado, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the others are, they're, they're a little less. In other words, there's a little more room that they have. And so we thought, well, that's an interesting way of categorizing municipal, of uh, the, the, restrict, the, the, the constraints on municipal behavior. But there's probably a better one. I mean, what if you lived in, what if you lived one of those washed out states on the West Coast, and you're in a city and you say, well, no, I can raise my property taxes. Why is that? Because you may not have filled up the gap. So we created a, a, a measure of the per percent property tax or an actual property tax gap that is that allowed by the tell minus the actual levy divided by the, the maximum amount. And we come up with something like this. If we cluster the cities into those that operate under binding uh, tax and expenditure limitations imposed by the state and those on, uh, that are non-binding, you can see that um, the non-binding tells have a, a lot of latitude on the property tax side. Not surprising at all. The point is that this is a mean. This doesn't include the variation among all the municipalities. So even those municipalities that have a little, the average is, is little, such as in, in 2006 when, or 2005 when only, there was only a 2% um, availability. Um, it was more for some, in fact, there were some that were beyond, they were actually in violation, but they had to get special exemptions of some sort. So I pulled out, um, I thought maybe some of you would identify with some of these cities, so I pulled out of our 100 city database a few in which we uh, actually calculated the maximum permissible levy, the 2012 actual tax levy, and then the gap. So the, the dollar amount in the gap uh, is, uh, is kind of interesting um, because it's, it tells you if you are an elected official, that's how much more you could actually raise your, your, uh, your taxes if you wanted to. So, you know, Raleigh could raise another $7 billion 
by raising the property tax to the, to, the, to the maximum, whereas Des Moines could raise one million by raising its property taxes to the, to the maximum. And Denver, of course, was out of whack. That was the year that it uh, repealed Tabor and allowed itself to uh, get out from under the restrictions imposed by, by Tabor, uh, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Um, locally imposed tells, as I said, this was um, a lot of fun to collect the data searching through all the ordinances uh, since 19, um, this begins in 1960, and it categorized, this is only for the 100 cities that were in the, that were in the sample. Of the 100 c cities, what this shows, if you go clear, I'd love to use this gadget, there we go. So if you go clear out to the end, it shows that about um, uh, 25 municipalities of the 100 have imposed some sort of property tax limit on themselves. So that, that's about a quarter of all of the municipalities in our sample. So, so it's not just, and those in addition to state imposed tells, these are additional property tax limitations imposed by the city. So they're constraining their own behavior, which of course is a little different than the state because if they constrain their own behavior, they can unconstrain their own behavior. Unlike, they, they can't tell the state what to do. So here's the measure of that I referred to as of, um, linking the fiscal architecture with the economic, the taxable economic base of the municipality. So what we've, what we've done here with the economic uh, uh, base is to calculate the percentage of the total municipal revenue generated from the sales tax, property, and income tax, and then assign that to the growth in retail sales to the assessed property or to per capita income so that if one grows but you don't have access to that, your, your uh, index is going to be much lower. If you do have access to it, your index is going to increase with it. So the, um, again, this is a, uh, the, uh, the states coded by, that's a duplicate picture, sorry about that. Uh, those are the states that have uh, one, two, and three revenue sources. Okay, so back to those same municipalities. Uh, they are rank ordered according to the breadth of their economic base, so, so Raleigh, uh, fortuitously has created a fiscal architecture that connected pretty neatly with its underlying economic base, which is why the economic base is, is at 79. Uh, it has a retail sales, let me back up just a second. Uh, these are not entirely consistent data, thanks to the Census Bureau. This for uh, per capita income, which is important only for those cities that levy an income tax, it's the growth between 2000 and 2010. For, the, for uh, retail sales, Retail sales, it's also, I'm sorry, for uh, property values, it's also the growth between 2000 and 2010 in property values. And then this third one, the latest we could get close to 2010 from census in the growth of retail sales was a 10 year period between 97 and 2007. Uh, 2007 is just the beginning of the, uh, the real estate uh, bubble burst, so it, it doesn't capture as 2010 does for, the, for income and values. Doesn't, uh, capture the full effect of the of the Great Recession, so it's it's a it's not quite what we would have preferred, but it's it's all we have right now. Um, so I, I call your attention to places where oh let me see if I have a mark yeah so uh, uh, places in which the uh, the um, uh, St. St. Louis, for example, there's a decline of uh, retail sales of 29%, but only a, an overall decline of 10%, and it's because it's offset by the growth in, in re, uh, real estate or property values, and the decline in income wasn't as severe as one might have expected between 2000 and 2010, and St. Louis does indeed have, have an income tax. Uh, Detroit, well, okay, there's Detroit, a uh, decline of 48% in per capita uh, in private income uh, between 2000 and 2010, but Property values actually increased during that, that period, starting from a low base. They actually uh, increased uh, f uh, during the 10 years, and, um, and retail sales dropped by 31%. So the overall effect was only a decline in 7% uh, in, the, in, again, the connection or the fiscal architecture between the economic base and the fiscal base. On a per capita, th this is, uh, I, I cannot explain the big numbers, the Portland and the Virginia beaches, but I think the other ones I can. The per capita f fiscal base change, so if you take the dollar amount change between 2000 and 2010 with the squirrely thing with the 2007 on retail sales, 
and you, you um, uh, calculate the per capita contribution that e all three of those have made, uh, the, um, uh, the dollar amounts or the, the, the change in the fiscal uh, base changed for, uh, for Tulsa from 5,000 to 12,000. Uh, I think that could probably be credited almost entirely to the fact if you look down at Tulsa, it's showing a small decline in retail sales. It's because uh, retail sales collapsed in Tulsa by 2008, uh, 9, and 10. That number would be much smaller than the 12,381 if we had 2010 data. Um, Virginia Beach is showing just to speculate, 122,000 because it's a high property tax dependent state, uh, probably a lot of growth in the commercial sector and, um, and at, in that 10 year t uh, period, uh, growth in the early 2000s. Uh, but so, at any rate, you can see the change in the fiscal base in, in that 10 year period uh, by, uh, by city. Not the, uh, again, not the underlying economy, but the, the connection between the fiscal architecture and the underlying uh, economy. Finally, the, the, the other attribute is called the demand index. That's preferences of the, uh, of the, the electorate, which we used the, th the three uh, measures of demand. And uh, Virginia Beach, Oklahoma City uh, are um, very, that, that's just inverted, very low on the demand side, whereas Detroit, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, and St. Louis, and Portland are, are on the other end, very high demand, which means high unionization, uh, democratic mayors, high demand for services, and, uh, and high poverty. So those are our three big measures that, that, uh, that we pull together in this uh, incredible two-dimensional, three-dimensional space. <laughs> uh, we, I'll come back with the cube. Uh, and we can see, this is, this is the three-dimensional space. The, uh, the y-axis is the, the, uh, the demand pressure. And the demand pressure, actually, uh, you can see it as the, uh, the, the little circle ball on the end of the string. That string is. Um, uh, if you, where the, uh, we'll give you an idea of where the demand variable is. Economic, uh, these, are, these are all uh, z-scores according to the, the, all the data from the 100 municipalities. So uh, the demand pressure, as you, as you go toward what is the negative three down there, um, it's not a zero base, but uh, it's, uh, that, that's the least amount of fiscal policy space that municipalities can operate in. Um, going in the other direction where they have a, a large property tax gap, that's what they could actually move into if they had to, or their economic, and their economic base was growing, that is the linkage between the fiscal architecture and the economic base was growing, and demand pressures were, were low, then you end up with those cities up in that, that cluster of cities that have um, a, a lot more fiscal policy space than, than other municipalities. Those of you who haven't passed the eye test yet, it, those are Raleigh, Richmond, Virginia Beach, Durham, Greensboro, Winston-Salem, uh, Fayetteville, and another city that got buried under there. On the other end are, not surprisingly, the cities of Detroit, Rochester, Buffalo, Cleveland, and Philadelphia. In other words, the cities that, are, that we consider to be suffering and having a lot of problems are those cities that don't have the fiscal policy space to address those questions to begin with. And those that are in fairly good fiscal policy space shape probably don't need help because they, they have enough space to work within uh, on, their, on their own. So just a quick uh, uh, descriptive between Virginia Beach and Detroit. Uh, property values increasing, decreasing as we know. Local tax authority uh, a little different. Per capita income is quite a bit different. State imposed to tell, not in, in Virginia. Um, tax revenue reliance, 50% of uh, Virginia Beach's uh, uh, budget is, uh, is generated on the basis of the levying of taxes. Uh, a very large debt capacity, not so much for Detroit. And fund balances in 2012 were in the opposite ways as well. So we started looking at, and this is the part that is not completed because this is the modeling part we're having difficulty with, and that is the fiscal policy actions. So what did Virginia Beach do <coughs> over the 20-year period of data that we collected? And this, by the way, um, even though the financial data we're collecting is every five years, the fiscal policy actions are every year. So from, from 2002 through, I'm sorry, from 1992 to 2012, uh, we've collected data on major policy actions that were considered or adopted uh, by the municipality. These are the ones that were just adopted or approved by uh, um, uh, the city councils. Property tax increases were proposed by Virginia Beach three times during this period of time. 
other taxes, again, major increases in the tax rate five times, and, and major increase in charges and fees. And let me just qualify that. Cities are always adjusting their charges and fees every year, every year. That's, this, these are major increases in charges and fees, one time for the city of Virginia Beach. Detroit, on the other hand, engaged in much fewer, at least over the 20-year period, in large uh, uh, changes to the, the tax and fee structure or, or spending or, um, uh, and then finally filing for bankruptcy. Um, again, Virginia Beach had the capacity, they had the fiscal policy space to move into particular areas, and they do. Those that don't have the fiscal policy space are constrained. So, what's next with the project? Uh, we're still going back to that beautiful model, uh, working through the cluster analysis to identify what cities are similarly situated to identify the types and understand the types of policy actions that they proposed and they took and the impact of those policy actions on constraining or opening up fiscal policy space uh, in the future. Second, uh, do fiscal policy actions create more fiscal policy space or less? Not, not, not all of them are the same and what are the, what are the effects in the future? So this is, we, I was talking with uh, students just before this, the, the, the decisions that were made 20 and 30 years ago to extend uh, pension benefits and other um, post-employment benefits that were made 20 years ago, that was great, it was an easy decision to make. Well, it had a huge impact today. Great, great decision at the time. Yeah, it was, as we were learning the term kicking the can down the road, uh, it was a great decision at the time that had just uh, consequences that are unimaginable today. We're, com we're continuing to, to uh, uh, refine and cleanse the database. It will be posted. We're trying to create a system whereby anybody can go in and pull down the data and, and do what you want with it. But also, for the other non-100 cities, uh, you can compare to what your data are compared to a city and see if, if there's a comparable city with, in terms of fiscal policy space that you might learn, you might learn from. So we're uh, creating that data portal. Um, New additions to the initiative, we're adding an infrastructure layer to it. As I said, we have some data on, on infrastructure and pension liabilities uh, for the last 10 years. Uh, again, the comparability of those data across a long period of time uh, is not so great, so we're sticking with the post-2002 or 3 era in which GASB 34 is pretty much abided by by at least these 100 municipalities, the largest ones, and with the other GASB rulings on pensions so that we have some consistent uh, estimates and consistent, I'll put in uh, quotation marks, because um, uh, how one uh, CFO um, measures the asset value of the municipality, especially an old one, is different than, than another. And then we're going to be uh, engaged, and we started the, this deep dive into some comparative case study analyses of those cities that are situated in similar types of fiscal policy space. Okay, so I, I, I promise that that that's, that's sort of the, the project, but I wanted to throw something out recognizing that there are some urban planners out here, and um, I, I think Liz said this might be something that you folks would be, some of your students might be interested in here. So let me throw out just, uh, as you are thinking about a brand new city and you're creating a whole new fiscal architecture for that city, what revenue sources would you consider? Would you consider the property tax? Would you consider the income tax? Would you consider the sales? Again, staying with the three main uh, general taxes. And understanding, at least what I would propose here, understanding that the selection of the fiscal architecture can have and will have an impact on urban design. Let's take the sales tax. If you have the sales tax, if you have access, to, and the, the, so you, you, you create a city and you say, you know what, we don't want to tax property, we don't want to tax, that's not good, people always fight about property, let's just tax retail sales will be 100% dependent on retail sales. And now, you're the, you're, the, uh, you're the CFO of the city, you're the mayor of the city, and you're building a new city. Where do you invest? Well, I propose what you do is you invest on the border of the city. That's where you build your shopping mall. That's where you build where people will buy things because the only way you can afford your city is if people buy things and you collect a retail sales tax from it. And who do you want to have pay for the retail sales tax? You want your neighbor to pay for it. <laughs> you want to offload. And where do you want to, so that's that middle, I think it's, the, yeah, the middle one. And where do you want to put your industrial parks? You want to maximize revenue by 
putting retail sales out as far away from the center of the city as you can so that others will pay. By the way, those, if you live in the middle of the city, if there's a residence in the middle of the city, you still have to shop in the edge of the city if that's where you're putting all of your commercial shopping centers. But so do the, uh, the neighboring municipality, dwellers in the municipality. And also that's where you want to offload your costs by building your industrial parks on the edge too. Why should you have to absorb all of the traffic congestion? Let's increase the costs on your neighbor as well. Look at some of the development options and activities in states that are heavily dependent on the sales tax. And you see something that is not exactly like this, but you can see the logic of trying to extend retail sales malls on the edge of the city. One of my favorite stories, this happened a long time ago now, and there's a postscript to it. Uh, back in the late 1990s, this, the city of, um, of Tempe, Arizona, which is completely surrounded by other incorporated municipalities, and the city of Gilbert, which is one of those municipalities, realized this, that they need to put their shopping malls at the edge of the city, and that would mean that they would each build one right next to each other, well, only one's gonna survive. So, remember the game of risk? Did you ever play that anymore, right? So what's the first thing you do when you realize that somebody's gonna invade your territory? You buy them out. So, city of Tempe said, look, Gilbert, we'll give you $2 million a year, $2 million a year, if you don't build here. They said, that's a great idea. They did that. I remember going back for an interview, a follow-up interview in about 2001 or 2002 and talking to the, um, uh, the city manager in, in Tempe and the city manager said, oh, by the way, Gilbert rescinded that agreement and now they're building them all right where they had come to an agreement for before. In other words, these are voluntary agreements and the, the, the logic of where you're generating revenue doesn't change. And so those agreements can come in, uh, uh, to be challenged as well. Uh, property tax dependent cities, uh, so that, that little egg sunny side egg, uh, is um, um, if, you, if you think about you as an investor of public money and you're going to invest and you want to get the biggest return, what do investments usually do? Investments usually, asset investments, physical infrastructure, uh, tend to benefit neighboring properties, right? So when the city comes through and puts in a nice new sidewalk and street and park system for you, the value of property tends to ripple effect, tends to benefit the neighboring properties. Why would you want to invest on the edge of the city and benefit your neighbor? Why would you want your neighbor to benefit from the investment that you made? So why not make sure that wherever you make an investment, the rippling effect of increased property values are captured by your own property tax collection system? So that, that encourages the investments away from the edges of the city, the, the capital investments and parks and recreation kinds of, of, uh, of investments so that the benefits can, can, be, uh, can be taxed. The third one on income tax dependent city, I still haven't figured that one out. I'm, I'm not sure what that does, except one thing we do know is that we want rich people to live in our town. So that, that's sort of, so when you think about creating your own city, um, and I know as planners, I am the dean of an urban planning school, so we, they talk about spatial modeling and transportation routes. And I said, so what kind of, how are you going to raise revenue to pay for all of this? Well, I don't know. We'll probably use the property tax. Then why would you want to build something on the edge of the city that's going to make a really nice, but you're paying for it. Why don't you bet? Oh, hmm. So what does that do? reliance on one of those three general tax structures. What does that do to your motivation, to your strategic behavior to make investment decisions? Interesting, fun planning exercise, which I don't know the answer to. So the fiscal policy, so go back to the original. This is, it's a, it's a frame. It's a new frame uh, for understanding constraints on cities' adjustments to the changing environment. And we think it's a new approach to understanding city fiscal behavior that proverbial mousetrap. And we do have a blog, who doesn't? We all have a blog. And th this is the, the team so far that's been working on the project. And I promise to leave some time for Q&A. So I'm done, thank you.
know how you measure the behavioral impact of different taxation schemes as you're balancing out because you're you're dealing with different cultures in each municipality and they can have similar con or constructs in terms of the structure. But how do you account for that, or how should we think through that? The, uh, on which part are you speaking now? Um, behavioral. Uh, so as you change your taxation structure, or if you're trying to maximize the optimum, mm -hmm. you might have an impact on your population. Mm -hmm. uh, we've mm -hmm. learned. Voting mm -hmm. with your feet and people mm -hmm. will move. I don't know how you account for that in your models. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. This, it, it is, uh, there are TIBO implications to this that we haven't, uh, that we haven't addressed. Um, we do have, um, um, the, um, so the, 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 the fiscal architecture of the city is designed by the city within certain limitations. Uh, how the city adjusts to that could actually have the effect of pushing people out. You're right. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure that um, that's sort of the, I think that we put that on the demand side of it, uh, the, although we've, the way we've measured demand doesn't include the capacity to migrate to other municipalities um, the, way we have it, uh, the way we have it set up. So it's not, it's not iterative in that sense that um, uh, because the reaction, the behavioral part of it is really, it's part of, um, it's a two-step process. It's an action's taken. An, an individual or firm decides to move someplace else uh, because, or, or that municipality or that county decides to offer something else to attract and this municipality responds in kind and so it can go, it can go back and forth. But we haven't, we haven't explicitly incorporated the, the uh, voting with one's feet in, uh, in this particular model. Comment and a question. Uh, you, your anomaly about Detroit's assess uh, property values rising during counterintuitive. Yeah. That's because the assessors were cheating on the high side. They discovered that, so that's being corrected big ah. time now. So, okay. Uh, so that number will change. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Be right. Counterintuitive why it's going down when everything else is going up, but that's why. That's why. Okay. A uh, second little tidbit is Detroit also has a casino tax, which also adds another dimension to this whole of the three sources you were talking about. Right. And finally, these, uh, this constrained FPS concept that you've described also tends to, because of that constraint, if it's at least reasonable, forces the communities to get more efficient. Mm -hmm. Can you touch on that mm -hmm. part of the equation? Yeah, so um, we, we have not, we have not, um, yeah, and I think it's almost the question on, on TIBO. We haven't talked about whether uh, services are being uh, delivered efficiently. Rather, what we've talked about was demand for services and measuring that as uh, a high, high union, uh, democratic city with a high poverty rate. So there, there's much more demand for services. Efficient service delivery is a whole new project and a great project, but it's not, it's not incorporated in this fiscal policy space. So do cities have, on the operating side, even within a constrained environment, they can, make, they can do productivity enhancements and performance measures that will, that will improve and still provide a higher or, or same level of services without a, any adjustments. And, and that's, that gets into the general operations of the cities, which we haven't done. Your slide that showed the property tax, sales tax, and income tax? Yes. Um, when I was following the housing bubble and the, and the collapse, I was looking at what was going on in Florida, and they had so many houses that had to be, they were submerged. Right. And I thought I read a reference that said that Florida had no property tax. They were depending totally almost on sales tax. No, no. You know, cities in Florida depend wholly on the property tax. They have, uh, Florida has, uh, municipalities have the authority to levy a, a sales tax for a specific activity, so for, um, uh, for bond issuance, for example, uh, for transportation and bond issue. But no, they're, they're wholly dependent on the property tax. The cities are. A question related to the issue about efficiency. So you also mentioned about like, city fiscal behavior. Did you connect data about expenditures by the cities? You know, actual expenditure. We we do have we do have data on expenditures, but uh, we've taken them from the CAFRs, so it's standardized data by gross accounts or, or uh, gross line items. It's not disaggregated very well, but you can see uh, a public safety line, for example, in '92. 97, 2002, 2007, 2012, and we have not gotten into an examination of the on the expenditure side. We have the data, 
but, but we don't have the analysis. I think the census of government has data on expenditure as well. Could you comment data. on the quality of it? I'm just always curious about the quality of that data set. No, the quality of the census data is, um, is okay. The only reason um, that I, I don't uh, for, for financial analysis purposes that I don't rely or use uh, census data is the following. Um, uh, census, census does, census's purpose is to provide uh, uh, data on revenue and expenditures that are according to their own definitions. They fit in the categories the way they want. And they ignore all fund boundaries. And because they ignore all fund boundaries, it doesn't give me an understanding of city fiscal behavior. Because when you combine all fund activities into, uh, into the, say, property tax receipts, it doesn't say whether I, as a mayor or, or, or the CFO, have control over that, those receipts. They can be dedicated for something else, or they can be part of an enterprise fund, or they can be in a special projects fund that cannot be used for the general operations of the city. So the, the motivation behind uh, the uh, the City Fiscal Condition Survey with the National League of Cities to focus just on the general fund was to look at the discretionary fund of municipalities and not total funds combined. And that's the, that's the biggest, for me, the biggest reason that I stay away from using census data if I want to understand what municipal officials are, are uh, making decisions about and what the revenue flow is. You need to look at the general fund. That's the discretionary part of, of the budget. Enterprise funds are prevented from spending on other activities, uh, usually by ordinance, if not, not by state statutes, and certainly by accounting standards. So uh, it's, the, it, um, and it's interesting you should mention that I just received uh, an email from the former director of government finance at the census who's, who's retired and saw that this, about this presentation. And his comment was exactly the same thing. He said, the data that census provides on government finances is not conducive to the kind of studies about city fiscal behavior. It needs to be disaggregated. And by, by uh, presenting general fund data, revenue and expenditure activity in the general fund, you're, you're focused on that part that city elected officials have control over. And the others are, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're just, they're set aside for a particular purpose and they can't be used. Uh, and they don't, they don't provide, they don't provide fiscal policy space because they're, they're separated. Research, have you seen or would you recommend a model for Michigan? And the reason I ask that question is so much of the conversation comes back to this idea of efficiency and things like that, which I think are quite frankly nonsense. Because the, the reality is the discretionary spending is not the issue. The issue is we have a cut only model in Michigan. Michigan municipalities have really no revenue generating space. And if you think about how, how municipal finances work, we're over 50% dependent, in most cases, on property taxes. And if my only way to balance my budget is to cut, which makes my place less desirable, it lowers my property values, which provides less income, and I'm in a death spiral. Mm -hmm. So what would be a model, based on the research that you've seen, that may be better in Michigan that allows you to invest, making the, the revenue drivers go up, which gives you the resource you need to do that? Because you have this disconnect between service demands, as you talked about, and the ability to generate revenue to do those? Yeah, that's the $64,000 question, isn't it? Um, uh, as I, I was talking with a group before this uh, presentation, my hope seven years ago, eight years ago now, my hope was that when this huge exogenous shock smacked the real estate market, after this enormous growth, so if you, if you saw those earlier slides about growth in revenue, I mean, property tax receipts were coming in hand over a fist, and then bam, the bottom fell out, and now we're going to, we're, the, the housing experts are saying, we're gonna go back to the modest growth in housing prices that we experienced prior to about 1995. And so we can't count on, on the, the piggy bank anymore that we can draw down on. And I was, I, I was hopeful that this would force, engender the kind of conversation to answer the question that you've raised, and that is what is, what is the appropriate fiscal architecture for my municipality? My municipality, not all municipalities. I, I'm afraid I have to plead ignorance about Michigan, but you do know there are, there are municipalities that are retirement communities. Why would you in a retirement community why would you not create a fiscal architecture and a spending apparatus that meets the needs, uh, which would be very different from um, a young 
20 and 30 year old uh, uh, community in which there are, are a lot of young people and, and children in, in elementary school. Very different set of demands, issues, and priorities. And the fiscal architecture needs to be layered onto that so that it matches the engines of growth of the municipality. And they're not always the same. They're not always the same. I, um, so, I, yeah, I think, I think we missed although we may not be done yet. We missed a huge opportunity in 2007, 2008 to engage in this, in this important political conversation about what's best for my community. Uh, we, we missed that, although I, I, I will also add that I think the, um, uh, at least for many municipalities, the pension crisis, the OPEB crisis, and uh, the infrastructure crisis are forcing those conversations now. Because now we're asking the question back to the question about uh, s efficient service delivery. Do we need all of those paved streets if we can't afford them? Do we need to pave all farm to market roads if only two tractors are using it a day? Do we need as many bridges that have a long useful life but they have to be maintained during that useful life? Are we willing to pay for it? And I would argue we've never had that conversation. Are we willing to pay for what it requires to provide an adequate level of services and an adequate sized infrastructure, not just today, but for your grandchildren. Are we all going to assume those costs from now until for the next 40 or 50 years, rather than saying, you know, 40 or 50 years from now, that's somebody else's problem. We're, we're right in the middle of uh, the effects of the largest infrastructure buildup in the United States with the uh, interstate highway system and with the huge expansion projects in the 1960s and 70s that, of course, we were all in favor of. It provided better water. It provided better and more efficient transportation. But the price we paid for it only paid for building it. That's it. It didn't pay for maintaining it for its useful life. Useful life has now, well, we've passed the useful life because we've under-maintained our infrastructure. And we've promised too much more than we can afford on the pension and the OPEB side. So th those conversations about what can we afford, not, not just what do we want, what do we like, but what can we afford, what are we willing to afford, we haven't had that political conversation. And when, when President Obama talks about the need for an infrastructure bill, yeah, I agree, but not the kind of infrastructure bill he's talking about. We need an infrastructure bill that pays for the maintenance of the assets that we've already built and haven't used, not new assets. So that was my political contribution. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're running through a simulation on uh, uh, cooperation in one of our classes, and, uh, which is a very hot topic. And I wonder if the FPS framework um, complicates, or well, if, it, if it means that regional cooperation it means that um, the, the most stringent constraints kind of uh, supersede those, those, uh, those more lax constraints and make cooperation regionally more difficult, or if um, there may be, in the case of you're doing re uh, revenue, tax revenue sharing or tax base sharing, if that can relax some of those constraints, um, if, if you uh, have any. It, it could work in either direction almost. Um, I, 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 uh, the, the vantage point that I come from is one in which I believe local, more local autonomy is better than less local autonomy. That means each municipality should design its own fiscal architecture, which may be different in the region, one neighboring city uh, to another. Um, and then it has the possibility of creating a Tebow effect, if that's, if that's the case, right? Um, and what does that do for, for thinking regionally? Um, I, I, uh, th this is sort of outside this presentation, but I don't think that you can think regionally when you have hundreds and hundreds of municipalities all trying to accomplish the same thing. Why were municipalities created to begin with? Do those lines need to, to exist? Uh, uh, Cook County, Illinois has over 170 municipal governments within the county, not counting the city of Chicago. They don't get along. So no matter what we find out in the fiscal policy space, how is it going to help them work together? I don't know. Maybe it will. If we recognize, um, which isn't part of this project, but if we recognize that the services that I'm consuming are provided by you and I'm not paying for them, maybe there's a way for us to look at consumption patterns of municipal services and figure out, figuring out a better way of um, a more, a fairer way, a more effective way of paying for those services. But that, that's somewhat apart from the, F, the, the fiscal policy space. Yes. Um, 
Out of the 100 cities that you did the case study of, is there a specific city you could identify that you found the data to be the most intriguing and why? <laughs> Uh, well, Detroit's certainly the most intriguing at this point, but we all know why. Uh, uh, most intriguing, no, but I will do a plug, because I know I'm supposed to look at the clock, and Barry told me that we're running out of time, so let, let me do this plug. Uh, uh, probably one of the most understudied uh, municipal finance systems in the country is the Ohio municipal finance system. Uh, th so this isn't from this study, but this is from um, other work that I've done. Because um, the question came up about a, a regional tax policy, and you know, we don't like to talk re about regional tax policies because that you're taking away my identity. How could I possibly? Go uh, so there are those kinds of, of concerns. But there are regional tax policies that aren't called regional tax policies, but it's like the duck; it still quacks like one. Uh, and that's the municipal income tax system in the state of Ohio, in which over 440 municipalities have the authority, they've taken the authority, it's a home rule state, they've taken the authority of approving an income tax at the place of residence and at the place of employment. This is different from what's happened in Detroit, which has, I know, the 50% income tax on, on um, uh, non-residents. This is one in which it is the dominant tax form for all municipalities. So if I want to go to another municipality, I'm not going to get a tax break on the income tax. So it, it doesn't create the Tebow effect. I'm not getting pushed from one community to another because of the income tax. Uh, school districts and property taxes are completely different, but for municipalities, that's not what pushes people away or attracts people. But because it's an income tax at the place of employment, Cleveland, Cincinnati, even Youngstown, haven't gone the way of coming under state receivership. Cleveland, for a whole different reason in 1979, had nothing to do with tax collections. It was completely political. It was about the electric utility power. But all of the other municipalities, the industrial structure, employment, and income are not too different from those in Michigan, New York, Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin. And yet those municipalities, because there still is an employment base, these are cities. It's not that everybody's abandoned the cities. There are a lot of white-collar workers. They are still paying an income tax to the city of employment. That's a regional tax. Washington, D.C. has been fighting this for years. It's called a commuter tax there. And as soon as you say commuter tax, the residents from Virginia and Maryland say, we don't want to pay for it. We're already paying our federal taxes. Well, yeah, that's right. But you're also using all of their facilities as well. And you're not paying for them. And that's what a regional tax does, is it distributes the, uh, the revenue from the region to cover the costs that are pro that of services that everyone benefits from. The municipal income tax in Ohio, study it. It's a great one. OK, I'm being pulled away. We, we do not customarily conclude programs here by saying, talking about innovative ideas in the state of Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> but there's always room for exception, especially when we are greatly in debt to our speaker. So please join me in thanking Mike for a very thoughtful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.